Oh, good morning. Welcome. This is part of the 2023 Illinois Farm Economic Summit Series, the IPAS Online. It's a series of six. If you're here, you're already signed up for all six. There are a few more left to do. Don't worry about those. We'll tell you more about them a bit later. Today, we're going to talk about the Farm Bill. Of course, that's uh, being renewed this year or should be. And Jonathan Kopp, is agricultural policy specialist here on the Urbana-Champaign campus of the U of I, is in studio with us to give us an update and an early look. Just a quick reminder, if you've got questions, you can ask them anytime during this webinar. We'll see them, put them in the gray boxes that are over on either the left-hand side of your page or down at the bottom, depending on what size screen you're watching on. Good morning to you, Jonathan. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Todd. And uh, just to just to keep it real, uh, we had we had to cross some signals and wires and, and stumble a little bit at the starting line. So thanks for uh, thanks for kicking us off and for all the work you do on uh, the Farm Economic Summit and keeping us uh, moving through this process. So as you have said, uh, this is our attempt, uh, my attempt, our attempt to give an early look and update of the Farm Bill. Another way to think about this maybe is a, a bit of a roadmap. Um, it is early. Obviously, anybody who follows the joys and pains of Congress knows that uh, they're just getting organized and started. Um, but you are correct. The existing current Farm Bill, that, which was authorized in 2018, is at least portions of it are scheduled to expire in 2023, which is the uh, impetus to get moving in Congress. If we uh, if we think about our uh, schoolhouse rock themed uh, path to a farm bill. We know we got to start in the committees at the House and Senate Ag Committees. Uh, what, what Schoolhouse Rock doesn't tell you is that the CBO baseline is a huge driver of things. And so we're waiting for that, that information to come out and be updated. If we get out of committee, we're on the floors. If we get past the floors, we're in conference. And if that all works, then eventually we get back through the floors and on to the president. Um, of course, uh, unless you haven't been uh, paying attention to the news, uh, it is possible that our first and maybe most important or most problematic roadblock could be the impasse right now around the debt ceiling. Um, I'm not going to delve too deeply into debt ceiling matters. Um, the, sh the, the short of it is that uh, there's a statutory provision that allows the federal government only to borrow up to a certain amount, and that is $31.4 trillion right now, which we reached a couple of weeks ago. It is uh, on Congress to revise that and raise the debt ceiling or uh, cease its operation to allow the federal government to continue to borrow, to pay the obligations, pay its bills, uh, and, well, preserve the full faith and credit of the United States government. So kind of a big issue um, in, in many ways. From a farm bill perspective, it is really a... a, a a potential disruptive aspect that we don't know how the consequences of it will will play out. So even if they raise the debt ceiling, if we look at the 2011 debate uh, that got derailed also by a debt ceiling uh, dispute, um, much of the cuts that came out as part of the 2014 Farm Bill um, were a result of those debt ceiling negotiations. So it isn't just that we're watching to see if Congress raises the debt ceiling without causing massive economic catastrophe, uh, but whether there are consequences or negotiations produce some sort of um, effort to cut spending or, or drive down um, drive down some of the programmatic outlays. So we, we're we going to wait and see on that, uh, but I'm not going to focus any further on that today because it's too unknown and, and um, <laughs> we're just going to have to wait and see. If we just focus in on our, our wonderful path to a farm bill, we know we start in the committees. And so we're going to take a, a brief detour through the, the Senate and House committees that are uh, with jurisdictional reach over farm programs and farm policy and farm bills that are going to be leading the effort. And if, if you've paid attention to this part of uh, the congressional setup, you know that the committees are the workhorses. They're the ones that do the hearings. They hold the investigations. They do the initial negotiations and drafting. They'll mark up legislation, report it out to the floors, and then manage the bills on the floor. So the committees are extraordinarily critical to how a farm bill gets written and shaped and uh, managed and negotiated. So in front of you uh, is my attempt to map the 
states who have senators on the Senate Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry Committee, um, using the standard blue and red for our partisan uh, divide. Chairwoman Stabenow out of Michigan and Ranking Member Bozeman out of Arkansas are the leads. Uh, and then for those uh, keeping track, Minnesota and Iowa each have both of their senators sitting on the Ag Committee. So that's kind of a unique situation. But this is sort of our regional state layout of, uh, of the committee. So one of the things that is sort of titled this kind of the search for common ground. We know the, the big ticket items in a farm bill, the programs with mandatory spending that we'll talk most about today, are the farm program payments, the conservation assistance, crop insurance, and the uh, food assistance to low-income individuals and households under the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. And so what I've tried to do is get um, some context around the committee membership and what some of the, you know, the priorities look like from different perspectives. And this is not, um, you know, any kind of hard and fast final thing. This is just a snapshot to get a sense of, okay, what, what are we looking at here from, if you're a member, if you're a senator on the committee and looking at these policies and programs, what are some of the things that might jump out at you? And so this first slide, is a uh, is an attempt to um, compare the SNAP participation in each state as a percent of the total population. So this would be the FY22 SNAP information from USDA and the Census Bureau's estimate of population by state. And you know what you see is is really the some similarities across uh, the states on the committee, but a pretty clear uh, level in which the you know the Democratic members have a have a lot higher participation rates in terms of the percent of their population, with the exceptions maybe of uh, Mississippi and Alabama compare pretty favorably to that. So we can see that um, we can see that as as part partially feeding priorities. If we look at the total number of farms as a percent of the total population, this is what it looks like. So I think it's fascinating as we think about negotiating and and the policy and politics around writing a farm bill. That the differences between uh, the states and the parties as between SNAP and total farms. Now, I do want to caveat this number. The total farms comes from the 2017 uh, Census of Agriculture. It is being used here to approximate number of farmers. It is not the number of farmers. This is the total farms counted in the census. So obviously this may not, uh, this will not uh, accurately represent all farmers or the exact number of them. But this is just, a, like I said, a sense to get uh, some context around it. So we see that the Republican states um, have a much higher percentage in general of total farms to the total population. So we can kind of see some of the partisan breakdown or the partisan uh, perspectives and priorities across these two major areas of spending. If we jump over on the other side of the hill, the House Agriculture Committee, uh, first off, I got to note this is an asterisk on this because as of last night when Jim and I were finishing the slides or uh, trying to, uh, the Democrats on the House Ag Committee apparently have three seats they have not filled yet. So this is a partial look at the House Ag Committee. There should be three more Democratic seats uh, eventually um, on the committee. So a look at it for now. Uh, again, you kind of see the regional breakdown. And uh, in particular, you'll, you can note the, the larger districts for Republicans, so the more rural uh, districts for Republicans, um, and kind of the coastal and city uh, in urban areas where we see a lot of Democratic seats for now. So we'll be, we'll be updating this as we go, as we get more information. If we try to get a sense of the same thing, so looking at total farms under the census as a percent of the total population, again, these are not total farmers, but total farms. Um, we see an even more stark difference than we saw on the Senate side where Republicans in the majority have a far higher percentage uh, in, in this comparison between farms and population. So obviously uh, another signal uh, of, of much more rural and farm uh, heavy or farm dependent districts uh, on, the, on that side. And if we look at SNAP, uh, we kind of get the opposite. Again, similar to what we saw in the Senate, we have a far more, uh, a far higher percentage of households. These are not individuals now. These are households receiving SNAP uh, for the congressional district profiles from 2018 as a percent of the population. Again, just rough measures to get a sense of, of the context and priorities. So we can see uh, not just the differences amongst the districts, but the the the, the differences among uh, between the parties on the committee between these two major pillars of the coalition and the farm bill. So that's kind of just a 
like I said, a snapshot or an overview of some of the politics and policy priorities that we're likely to see that, that feed through it. I'm gonna next jump to probably everybody's least favorite topic and, and certainly one of the more uh, difficult matters uh, in a farm bill discussion, and that is the budget. Uh, in particular, the Congressional Budget Office or CBO uh, produces an annual baseline and it is the baseline that we expect them to produce here in the coming weeks that will be the budget for a farm bill in 2023. So before we look at that, I want to look backwards a little bit. And the Congressional Research Service has helpfully compiled the last 20 plus years of actual spending under the farm bills going back to 1990. Um, and then it has added, and this is from a couple years ago, so it's a little bit dated. It has added the projected spending that CBO had back in 2019. What I think we take away from this is another snapshot of the politics and the challenges in negotiating and moving a farm bill through Congress, as well as some of the policy trends uh, in this bill. And so if we start at the bottom of this chart, the conservation programs we see having steadily increased in spending since 1990, which makes sense because uh, the current conservation suite of programs was uh, authorized in 1985. And so we've increased in uh, the programs, we've increased funding as we went since 1985 and 1990. So pretty pretty standard upward, simple upward trend there. The red bars are our Title I co commodity programs, uh, the, the farm support, safety net, subsidies, whatever titles you want to use for them. Uh, and you can see the counter cyclical nature of those, you know, when prices are low or revenues are low, we see higher spending under those. Uh, when prices are doing well, you see a lot less spending under the Title I programs, particularly since 2014 when the direct payment program went away. Um, these are much more uh, dependent on the on the markets and what, what prices are doing, at least on a national average across a 12-month marketing year. And then finally, the blue bars are the third bucket of mandatory spending for uh, farm policy, and that is the crop insurance program which has really taken off since the uh, massive reform effort in 2000 that increased uh, premium assistance, increased uh, participation as a result. So that's the farm side of the equation, if you will. Um, and then obviously what stands out to everybody are the uh, food assistance or SNAP outlays in the, I think those are kind of an orangish color, salmon maybe, I don't know. Um, that has grown substantially since 2008 and the Great Recession. Of course, the pandemic will have also impacted this, and so we will, um, we will uh, see an increase in that in the CBO baseline. But sometimes what we get lost in these big numbers um, are the realities of these two programs. And we are serving roughly 40 above 40 million Americans who are low income, who are struggling to put food on the table. And the SNAP program provides them direct assistance to purchase food and to help them manage that uh, series of challenges at the household and individual level. So it isn't, if all we do is look at the dollars, we, we tend to over-focus on SNAP as a, as a blunt amount of spending. But when you think about the number of people who are being helped by this and being helped to purchase food, I think it puts that program in a different context. Um, so this chart, again, this is dated. We, we're waiting on CBO to release the new baseline estimates, but this is a snapshot from, from May of 2022. And what is critical about baseline uh, for a farm bill is that under the statute, under the federal budget statutes, CBO is required to assume the bill as it currently is written, does not change for 10 years into the future. And then they model all of the expected spending under that statutory uh, outlet or that statutory scheme, assuming no changes. This is what they projected in May of 2022. I don't think we'll see a huge change in this uh, coming up, but we may see, you know, we may see some of the, the programs uh, revise a little bit in their estimates. So we're looking at roughly 120 to up to $130 billion a year. So in a 10 year budget window, that will come out as a, as a $1.3 trillion price tag. But again, remember that that's 10 years, that's not a trillion dollars every year going out the door. 
And of course, we still expect the SNAP program to be uh, the largest source of spending, the largest source of outlays, and, and the um, largest amount of beneficiaries of the program still exceeding uh, 40 million in the early years and, and out into uh, the out years of this baseline. What is critical about this, as anybody that's uh, dealt with farm, recent farm bills knows, the, the baseline is the budget the committees have to work with. And under budget rules, uh, they are required to stay within this baseline. And so any changes to statute will be scored by the Congressional Budget Office, and those changes have to be offset. So that means you have to cut other programs to offset increased spending. Uh, it used to mean you could raise revenue if you needed to. The House has implemented new rules uh, this year, this Congress, that would require cuts, so you cannot increase revenues in any way, shape, or form. So this really creates a, a zero-sum political game under the baseline. What happens if you want to spend more money on Title I payments? Well, under the rules, you're going to have to cut something else. You have to cut within the jurisdiction of the committee, and that means you're going to have to likely look at either SNAP, crop insurance, or conservation as a source of offsets. And of course, the politics of that are, well, rather challenging. Um, so we'll be watching closely what CBO puts together as the expect, expected baseline and, and think through then how that might shape the negotiations for any of the, the programmatic or policy requests people have. Just digging into this a little bit more uh, to provide some more context. Again, this is the outdated baseline, but you know, I, I don't think we see a whole lot of change. Uh, and we'll be looking for fiscal year 24 out through 2033 as our 10-year window. This is crop insurance. And the main thing, the main takeaway here, uh, particularly if we are dealing with trying to find offsets for other programs, is that the really the main way to cut spending in crop insurance is through the premium subsidy. So that is the the portion of the farmer's premium that is covered by uh, the federal uh, taxpayers through the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation. Um, so when you hear offsetting out of crop insurance, you're likely talking about premium subsidy first and foremost, or as the easiest way to get to it, to spending reductions. In Title I, uh, the commodities program, so PLC, the price loss coverage program, that's our fixed price uh, program. We got a price set in statute. We'll talk about this one a little bit more as we go. Um, the agriculture risk coverage at the county level and at the individual levels are also built into this. And you can see, again, the, the expectations back in May uh, was, was for pretty low spending here in the near term uh, with higher, stronger prices. I expect that to probably even be more, more pronounced at a low level, uh, given where we think prices are going to be in the next few years. But we are looking out over 10 years. And so CBO is typically going to expect that these programs spend uh, and that those prices readjust down closer to the reference prices in PLC in particular in the out years. But we've got disaster programs for livestock and, and trees and, and other programs as well as uh, the dairy margin program built into this too. So just a sense of this, both the counter cyclical nature and the out year expectations that CBO had back in May. Um, this is likely to be the one that changes the most in their upcoming baseline. And we mentioned this, so just, just a reminder of the price loss coverage program and what we're seeing in this baseline. So how is it that we're spending, you know, these large, expected to spend these large sums in, uh, you know, 26, 27 and beyond? And a lot of it is, is, is due to how the price loss coverage program works. And that is Congress sets a fixed price. Let's take wheat, for example. Wheat's reference price is 550. If during the course of the 12 month marketing year following wheat harvest, the national average price received by farmers is below that 550, we trigger payments. And so when CBO does their calculations, they estimate, uh, you know, they forecast, they use USDA forecasts and others to try to get an estimate of where prices are going to be over this long, long 10 year window. And here you can see in particular wheat expected to be below its reference price in the out years. So 26 and beyond. And that's triggering a large amount of those payments. Soybeans, by comparison, is expected to stay well above its reference price of 840 and, and tr likely not to trigger any payments. Corn's a little bit closer to that reference price, so it's feeding some expectations of spending there, but not a lot. By comparison, looking at our other three major crops or, and major both in terms of acreage, but also in terms of the political uh, uh, influence, if you will, or political footprint in these discussions. If we look at our Southern crops, cotton, rice, and peanuts, um, 
we can see quite a bit of difference in the way the PLC program operates for these crops. So all three of them are expected to be below their reference prices in the out years. Now, again, this will this is likely to adjust in, when CBO re forecasts. Um, but peanuts, I think, is is probably the one that jumps out the most. And it is it was projected in May to be well below its reference price. So the expectations in this program would be payments every year and large payments for peanuts, which if we take the, uh, the expected outlays that CBO projected back in May and we divide it by the number of base acres that, that are in the program, this is what it looks like year over year, crop by crop. And the main takeaway here is the, the, the importance of where that reference price is set it's also a reminder of this baseline challenge because rice and peanuts are the smallest crops in the program. So if you increase their reference price, you can spend a lot more money per acre on those crops and those farmers who have base acres of those crops, but it doesn't show up in the baseline the same way. And this is, you know, a bit of a challenge for crops like corn and soybeans. Soybeans in particular, if we go back up here a minute, if soybeans want to move that reference price closer to where the forecasted prices are going to be, we're talking 50, 60 million acres potentially uh, expected in that program, which is going to spend a lot more money in the baseline and be extraordinarily costly over a 10 year window. And so it challenges these larger crops under this baseline sort of zero sum game that they cannot, uh, they cannot as easily increase the trigger points for program payments because they're paying out on such large acreage and large acreage with payments over 10 years is extraordinarily expensive in the baseline. So this is, if you will, this is sort of a rough perspective around some of the politics uh, in, at the committee level in particular, around how these programs are, are created, how we negotiate things like the fixed reference price in the <laughs> statute, um, kind of who wins and loses in that undertaking. Um, and certainly, you know, these, these politics break out on the regional lines because the Southern crops are getting these larger payments every year. And, uh, you know, their membership is more likely wanting to protect that or improve that. And so these are some of the, some of the indicators of, of the political challenges that we'll, we'll see at the committee level in particular. A lot of this won't get worked out on a floor debate because it's pretty, pretty deep in the weeds of the policy, but it certainly is something that the committees will, will work a lot on. So we'll update all of this uh, in some farm doc dailies as we get the new CBO information. But uh, here's a snapshot based on what they thought things would look like back in May of last year. So as mentioned, uh, the 2018 farm bill has uh, nearly run out its five year life, but this farm bill's existence has been rather unusual in terms of farm bill history and expectations. This chart before you is a comparison of what was spent, uh, 2022 forecast to be spent under the farm programs, that's the, the Navy bars, and then the supplemental and ad hoc programs that have uh, kicked in since 2018 with the Mark of Facilitation program in 18 and 19, and then of course the coronavirus response programs and payments in 2020 and 2021 and into 2022. And so this is unusual for multiple reasons. It is rare to in fact, it's never happened that we've seen this level of ad hoc spending on farmers in addition to farm program payments. Um, it is unusual for there to be multiple years of this. Typically, we'd see an ad hoc, you know, in response to a drought or hurricane scenario. Um, but to go through multiple programs over multiple years created using, uh, largely using the existing authorities and the Commodity Credit Corporation. Um, it's pretty unusual to see that kind of year over year aspect. So almost the entire life of this farm bill has been um, shadowed by this ad hoc and supplemental spending. And then, you know, the other side is it's just unusual for there to be that much more spending through an ad hoc system than, than the, the authorized programs. What does this mean for a 2023 farm bill debate? I think is one of the big questions we have before us and that the committees have before them in this discussion. For one thing, it is certainly uh, challenging perspectives around what um, what spending goes out to farmers and and how the programs work and look to them. Uh, particularly under the coronavirus assistance programs, we uh, provided assistance to a much larger population of farmers, a much larger set of crops. 
fruit and vegetable crops, livestock, who don't typically get Title I program payments. Uh, how does that imp impact their decisions and their requests in a farm bill? And how does that play out given the baseline limitations we have? So I think this is kind of one of those, uh, you know, as we, we look at our roadmaps, this is this can be one of those challenging areas on the path, um, sorting this out and, and helping uh, particularly some of the, the farmers and crops who don't typically get assistance but have seen it in recent years leading into this farm bill. Again, I don't have answers on that uh, unless uh, Nick also shaking his head. This is this is something we'll be watching and looking to discuss as we go. All right, I want to jump uh, further through the baseline and get us just updated on a couple other things that are both standard for a farm bill and unusual since 2018. Here's a conservation program outlays by fiscal year again from the May 2022 baseline. Um, don't expect CBO's upcoming baseline to change much here, but these are the suite of conservation programs that receive assistance or through which farmers and landowners receive assistance. Uh, the big ticket item is the Conservation Reserve Program, running at roughly 21, 22 million acres uh, and about $2 billion a year in the out years. Um, it is followed in size by the Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Of course, CRP, sorry, I should mention CRP, of course, is the land retirement, uh, temporary retirement, long term 10 year contracts to, to put acreage under conservation cover rather than production. EQIP is the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, that is the direct cost share assistance to the farmer for adopting uh, conservation practices on that farm. So this goes for everything from, you know, adopting cover crops to uh, improving your manure management if you got a livestock operation, to establishing fences and uh, dealing with irrigation challenges and so forth. Um, so that's the second largest program. That's a working lands conservation program. So that assistance goes to farmers who are still in production as compared to CRP, which takes land out of production. And then CSP, the Conservation Stewardship Program. This one's a little bit complicated in the chart, but this is the five-year annual contract. To, to uh, qualify for the program, you have to be uh, meeting certain levels of conservation, and then you're going to agree over the life of that five-year contract to improve and expand upon that conservation across your entire farm. It was changed pretty significantly in the 2018 Farm Bill. And so given that it's a five-year program, you're seeing some of the legacy spending there, which will shift into the, the 2018 version of it uh, into the out years. And so uh, again, this is an annual contract payment for conservation <clears throat> on working lands as well. And uh, yeah, we got some Inflation Act, <laughs> Reduction Act questions that we'll get to here in just a minute. So uh, be patient with me. Uh, the other the other bit of the uh, alphabet soup on the screen in front of you, uh, ACEP is the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. So these are conservation easements placed on land that run with that land are typically long-term or permanent changes. So this is often for things like uh, maintaining or reestablishing a wetland on the farm or uh, some of the farmland protection uh, policies that help put easements on farmland to uh, protect it from developmental pressures. So you think uh, urban sprawl, suburban sprawl uh, protections. And then the Regional Conservation Partnership Program there at the top was created in the 2014 Farm Bill. It works across these types of policies and programmatic issues, and it combines uh, public-private funding. So, so private partners come in and help fund conservation on a regional scale. So maybe we're, we're looking at a, you know, an upper Mississippi River Basin effort um, or a Great Lakes effort or out west, the Colorado River uh, conservation effort that would be on a regional basis that we can get private partnership funding to help both implement the program, but also help fund the conservation practices on the farm. And so roughly, when we look into the out years, we're, we're topping $6 billion a year in conservation. Um, as will often be said in hearings on this, this is this is understood to be the single largest federal investment in conservation on private lands. So uh, this program, these programs typically have a lot of support, but the challenge again being the baseline uh, issues in, uh, in increasing anything there. With the, uh, with the exception of the Inflation Reduction Act. So this is where we get into what the other item that makes the 2018 Farm Bill experience very unusual, very unique, and certainly adds uh, some uncertainties around what this farm bill debate looks like. So in August of 2022, Congress passed through budget 
reconciliation procedures, which allows them to bypass uh, some of the rules, such as the Senate's filibuster and 60 vote threshold requirements that really can bog down legislation. But it means it passed on a party line basis and it was signed into law in August. Uh, it was a massive bill uh, with funding all across, all across the different areas. Um, you know, this, this is, there's a lot of focus on climate, healthcare, and, and some tax policy changes, but tucked within this is something very important for the farm bill. And that was what you see on the screen before you. So for fiscal years 2022 through 2025, the Inflation Reduction Act, and this might be offset by a year, um, should go to 26. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act appropriated large additional amounts of funding for um, EQIP, for CSP, for the easement program, and the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. The total appropriation was exceeded $18 billion over this time frame. What I'm trying to show with this chart, and, and this is where Nick laughs at me a little bit, because this, this is my attempt to use uh, charts and numbers is that this is not baseline funding. This was a separate appropriation. So we have these programs, they have permanent funding through the Commodity Credit Corporation, that's in the solid bars there below, the programmatic levels, that is baseline. The Inflation Reduction Act provided this additional appropriation. It's a multi-year appropriation. The authority extends through 2031, so they have time to spend it but it is not a baseline change. And so CBO will not be considering that in the Farm Bill baseline uh, for 2023 looking forward, which means it also is not uh, you know, part of that baseline negotiation and calculation the same way. So I wanna be clear that, that this additional funding um, exists on top of or in addition to the baseline funds in a Farm Bill. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not laughing at you, Jonathan. I was laughing at the, the question we got about this, <laughs> which I want to make sure we answer directly. Yes. Um, we actually got the same question, I would say, asked in an optimistic way and a pessimistic way. <laughs> I so, right. and, I, and I think the answer is in the middle. Um, and, and you answered it, but it doesn't, it doesn't change baseline. Yeah, um, not only does it not change baseline, so this is where it gets a little bit uh, tricky. So, remember, we've got 18 billion roughly that was appropriated in the Inflation Reduction Act. So, so moving from this rather confusing chart to this rather confusing chart, again, the pattern bars are the same as here, roughly. So that's what Congress appropriated in that act. As I said, it's available to be, spended, to be spent through 2031. So they don't have to spend it in the year that it's um, appropriated in the statute. And so Congressional Budget Office back in September gave us this estimate of what we would say is the outlay schedule. This is how they think USDA will spend these funds over the 10 year the 10 year author or 10 year appropriated window. And you can see that sort of slow buildup that that is very different than the appropriated amounts eventually building up to roughly 3 billion plus uh, in 2027 and then beginning to kind of tail off towards 2031. So there's two key aspects of this for the questions that came in about what does this mean for a farm bill? The number one thing we have to know that this means for a farm bill is that this is not baseline money. This is not going to be subject to the baseline uh, estimates and it, it isn't available within that baseline. Sounds like there's a but though. <laughs> but it is spending that is out there and is estimated. How CBO puts this into its uh, baseline forecast or how it writes this and shows this, I, I do not know. Um, but what we see are these amounts. So when you total this up, it actually comes out to probably roughly 15 billion in spending um, through 2031. Now, for a farm bill, while this money is not within the baseline, it is appropriated dollars that are available. If Congress so chose, you could write legislative text that rescinded some part or all of the appropriated amount, capture that savings as an offset maybe, which is only the dark bars, and re-spend it somewhere else. 
Now, the challenge that I don't have an answer to, and we have to and I have to wait and see how CBO sort of analyzes this and, and how they score different things is exactly what that means for the baseline, right? Because we're scoring 10 years into the future. If you use this as an offset, you're going to have to somehow pay for the cost in that baseline. And I don't know that interaction. Uh, that's actually one of these strange and wonderful internal things that will go on as they debate a farm bill. So the rough answer to the questions is, yes, it's not in the baseline, but it is additional funding that may be available to be rescinded or cut as an offset. But there's a whole lot of unknown about how exactly that would work, how much you can, how much savings you can get as an offset, and how it will then factor into the baseline uh, scoring analysis that CBO will do. So, <clears throat> yeah, follow-up question, Jonathan. And I'll, <laughs> By all sorry means. to put you on the spot here. No, no. But um, <clears throat> is, is another way to look at this, or, or is this a potential threat to the conservation baseline, given how partisan yeah. basically every piece of legislation, particularly the IRA, was, will there be, do you anticipate or you expect efforts to look for some of those zero-sum game cuts in conservation with the rationale being that the IRA has these dollars allocated to programs that very much fit in that conservation bucket. Um, and so it'll be easier to, to justify cuts to finance increased spending in the commodity title or other areas of the farm bill. I mean, not only that, I think it gets, I think it gets even better uh, in a sense. And I, I mean that kind of uh, facetiously or sarcastically. So you can just imagine that somebody looking at this says, oh, there's a $15 billion offset sitting there. All I got to do is resend the so I want to create a new program in Title I, for example, and I want to, it's going to cost me a billion dollars a year, so I'll just cut IRA money and, and repurpose it for that program. Of course, if somebody's thinking that, somebody else is thinking about using it for something else. And so you can see this being spent four, five, and six times over if you're not careful. Um, so it, it kind of, it, it's kind of a, almost a little bit of a trap in that sense that, you know, it can over, it can feed an over expectation of being able to use it for an offset. To your question, it gets even more dicey if somebody's looking at this and saying, well, conservation has got all this additional funding, so EQIP doesn't need the, the $2 billion it's authorized to have now. Let's go cut EQIP in the baseline. That's a 10-year save, and they can deal with it through this. And that that's becomes, certainly, challenging. That that's becomes certainly, challenging for 28, Yes, because then we're talking about the 28 baseline, the next four bill, right. being negatively impacted by this trading dollar strategy. Now, that's absolutely correct, because the problem under the baseline statute in, in the books, these are permanent funded matters. So what you change in the baseline runs permanently. So if you cut equip, it will then be incorporated over, you know, the expect uh, the life of that program. And so it could become a much larger reduction if somebody went after, say, the, the equip baseline dollars to to offset something else because they think this this inflation reduction act fills it up. I think it's more likely that the political pressure is on the inflation reduction act funding itself than it would be under the baseline of conservation programs. But look, I I, I agree with you. I think in our current political environment, you know, there's a whole lot of possibilities here that um, we don't know about and it, it remains to be seen. And just to add a little bit more of the partisan flavoring to that, that aspect and conversation and Nick's question in particular, not only was the Inflation Reduction Act passed solely on Democratic votes, so it was partisan, it funded only conservation programs, it was also designed largely to address climate change. And of course, uh, climate change has become an unfortunate political football, a partisan football, in which um, it's been real hard to, to have some of that bipartisan agreement we need to see. Now, these funds were designed specifically for conservation practices or enhancements that improve soil carbon, reduce nitrogen loss or other nutrient loss, capture, avoid, or sequester carbon dioxide, methane, or nitrous oxide emissions. So very much built around uh, this, this reduction of emissions or losses and attempts to address climate change through agriculture, through farming, <laughs> practices and conservation practices, something that might store carbon in the soil, for example, as well as reduce losses. So that, I think that adds, you know, the next question that adds some partisan 
uh, complications and components to this additional spending makes it, in, I mean, just to be blunt, I mean, it just makes it a bigger target in the House where uh, Republicans have a majority and uh, are likely looking for offsets uh, for some of the things they have prioritized uh, in their um, thinking for a farm bill. So I think this is going to get, this is going to add complications. Uh, it's sort of maybe ironic that anytime you have some additional funding, it tends to complicate the discussion more than it makes, than it eases things. Um, so we'll be watching closely to see how this plays out, but I do, I do expect there to be quite a bit of uh, focus on this. Let's see, we got a question. With that understanding of conservation spending, does this actually make it more likely that folks supporting conservation ultimately would be more supportive of an extension rather than completing a full farm bill? Well, that's, that's a heck of a question. Um, I think, so I think part of that is challenged by the fact that we see conservation programs um, have already been extended by the Inflation Reduction Act through 2031. So normally they would have expired, uh, their th authorization would have expired in September of this year, but to, uh, to deal with the Inflation Reduction Act spend out and uh, the budget requirements and a reconciliation bill, um, those authorizations have been extended to 2031. So conservation programs are not expiring uh, this, this year. That leaves the farm program expiration dates in place and all the other programs that have 2023 uh, expiration dates, things like the trade assistance and the authorizations for rural development and research and so forth. Um, so that will also feed into the complicated politics of this, you know, how conservation groups look to, uh, to negotiate this. Um, I would not want to hazard a guess, but I do think it does, it does alter uh, what we've seen traditionally. Um, around the negotiations. And you know, I think the blunt answer is this puts, this puts conservation in a slightly stronger place than maybe it traditionally has been. Um, but they're also defending a large amount of additional spending that is going to be attractive to others. So a lot to be determined there. Um, and of course, uh, conservation programs and policies have largely been bipartisan. They've been out of the partisan fray for the most part. They're strongly supported across, um, well, across farming and farm interests. They're strongly supported outside of farming. They make for a really valuable uh, sort of political bridge to those who are not in farming to understand some of the things we're doing to help farmers. And of course, they help everybody. You know, if clean water is a benefit for everybody. Uh, reducing soil erosion benefits both the farmers and you know, we don't have to clean that, those soils out of rivers and waterways. So it would be really unfortunate, I think, um, if conservation policy became much more partisan because of this, this situation. So it's something to watch for um, and watch out for. Um, and hopefully we don't see it degenerate further. So with that note, uh, I, we always want to remind ourselves that the political strength of a farm bill is in its coalition. And this is a broad coalition that spans many parts of the country. And we think about subsidies directly to farmers, plus low-income food assistance, and conservation sort of bridging uh, between the farm and non-farm sectors. Um, and and this, is the, this is one of these great charts put out by a, a, a professor at Princeton. Who This is the 2020 presidential election with the size of the bar being the, the number of voters in the county. And so you can just, this is just a nice reminder that we have this very, um, very different political scenarios on the coast and the cities and in rural America. And so part of that strength of a farm bill is really around this ability to connect from different parts of the country, different, you know, places where parties have different strengths and, and so forth. Um, and so getting a farm bill done typically requires keeping that coalition both together, but also functioning so that it's working um, in a, in a functional way. And here's the, the house districts um, mapped by district by uh, results from November of 2022, um, just kind of reinforcing the sort of uh, geographical challenges and the political divides that we see in Congress. And I think this helps support uh, this, this understanding of the strength of the Farm Bill and its coalition. For the house in particular, they gotta have 218 to get a majority. And there's 222 Republicans and 213 Democrats. Actually, it might be 212. I think there's a special election coming up. 
Um, but really a, a four vote margin for Republicans in the House. And so keeping a bipartisan strong coalition is absolutely necessary to getting through the House floor in particular. And uh, if we question that, I guess we can go back at some recent history and see kind of what's happened. Uh, if we go all the way back, 1996 uh, was a major reform effort um, that decoupled farm program payments. It was followed by uh, some, the Asian financial crisis and a pretty significant collapse in crop prices in the turn of the century or turn of the millennium. The 2002 farm bill is the most significant anomaly in the budget era because it is the only one that have get, been provided additional baseline dollars, roughly 74 billion or so in additional baseline. Congress spent the vast majority of that on farm support payments, mostly in the countercyclical program uh, and the bring and the inclusion of soybeans in the base acre um, base update provision. And that's also the last time we've updated base acres for the programs. 2008, strong prices under the WTO or excuse me, under the RFS. And, and we had the WTO cotton controversy and largely a farm bill that was status quo. What weren't many changes in that, uh, although there's some reminders of things to watch out for, like the complicated and problematic uh, supplemental disaster assistance programs that were created in 2008. But it's really the 14 and 18. The last two farm bills are the ones that really stand out uh, in terms of our political coalition or the warnings, if you will, of what happens when we tear this apart, particularly in the House. So the 2014 farm bill, uh, clouded by and complicated by a debt ceiling fight that happened in 2011 and resulted in the, the reduced spending, particularly the elimination of direct payments in a farm bill. Um, in the House at that point in time, uh, there was a huge partisan fight over the SNAP program, and that caused the farm bill to initially be defeated on the House floor in 2013. And as according to uh, my read of history, the only other time a farm bill had been defeated prior to that was in 1962 before the SNAP program was, the then food stamps was, was enacted in 1964, largely because of some of the challenges or some of the challenges for farm policy in the early 60s helped uh, form up the uh, political move that brought the food stamp program into existence in 1964. So that's the first time that happened. And the only time it's been defeated twice in the House was the following 2018 um, farm bill, which also featured a fight, a partisan fight over SNAP that broke apart the coalition and left uh, the farm bill vulnerable on the House floor. This time it was held up by uh, immigration, uh, the demand for immigration by some, some members in the House. And when they got that vote, then they were able to uh, pass the farm bill. So we were able to succeed both times, but it was drastically complicated in the House over this fight to, uh, to cut the SNAP program and the controversies that brings. All of which leaves us in uh, full of questions and question marks for a 2023 Farm Bill debate. And I think most of that begins with, if we see a budget-based partisan fight come out of this debt ceiling issue that focuses on cutting the SNAP program, we are unlikely to see a Farm Bill in 2023 and maybe even longer. We're unlikely to see a, a very traditional, functional, coalitional effort in the House and the Senate. So this is kind of our big warning sign. If we're going to go down that path again, um, we're going to have a lot of problems getting the bill done. And this is sort of one of those moments to remind everybody that uh, the, typically those who want to cut the SNAP program the most also want to cut farm program payments, crop insurance, and conservation. It's usually tied up in a larger fight over getting rid of, eliminating, or scaling down federal programs. So we don't just see it focus on SNAP overall. It, it just sort of starts there uh, with, a re with an understanding if they can break apart the coalition, they can take everything down uh, is usually the mindset in that. So just a lot of warnings if that's the path we're headed on. And with that, um, we take some more uh, questions here. We will oh. indeed. We do want to thank our sponsors as oh, yes. well. They include yeah. the TIA Center for Farmland Research, Compare Financial, Corteva AgriScience, Farm Credit Illinois, FS Growmark, the Illinois Corn Growers Association, and the Illinois Soybean Association, and of course our educational partners, uh, partners including Illinois FBFM, that's the farm business, farm management folks, U of I Extension, and the Department of Agricultural and Consumer Economics. A couple of things before we get to those questions, and you can write a few more in if you'd like. We have some upcoming 
IFAS Online or Illinois Farm Economic Summit. You're already signed up for these. Next week, we'll talk about farmland prices and the interest rate outlook with Bruce Sherrick. And then the whole of the Farm Doc team should be in on February the 23rd for you to ask questions of them and kind of wrap up what's happening. And then following that, there are a couple of other things that are coming up. Uh, Gary Schnitke has a two-part webinar uh, on crop risk management. If you sign up for the first one, you're signed up for both of them. They're February 16th and March 2nd. And uh, Bob Ray from FBFM, along with uh, Brad Zwilling, will be on deck on the 21st. Uh, sign up with this for this one separately about the top 10 business strategies they think should be um, possibly deployed for this coming year. Of course, you can always find all of these uh, links on the Farm Doc Daily website at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu. And, uh, or you can just look in YouTube at youtube.com backslash at Farm Doc if you're looking for the archives of any of these events. There's one other event that I know Jonathan Coppice and Nick Paulson, you will both be attending. That's March 7th at the Beef House in Covington, Indiana. This is the 32nd annual All Day Ag Outlook. The Farm Doc team and the agricultural brokers and analysts that I talk with on the radio station every day will be there, along with Mark Cheney, who is a graduate of ABE, the Agricultural and Biological Engineering Department. Here in the College of ACES, he works for John Deere, has for more than 20 years, uh, is based in Research Park, but handles automation, artificial intelligence, and he'll be talking about the kinds of things Deere will be deploying in the future. It's very data-centric. I talked to Mark, and it should be a great program. The cost for that one is actually $30. You can sign up either at the Farm Doc Daily website or willag.org, either one. Let's continue now to get a couple of questions in. I take it you both had a, some time to take a look at them. What do you see that uh, you're interested in answering at this point, Jonathan? Well, the the yeah. ad hoc question is <clears throat> maybe one I'd be, I'd be interested in Go tackling for it. that one a little bit. Go for it. Um, so we have uh, one, of the, one of the listeners was uh, kind of returning to the ad hoc disaster payments outpacing farm bill safety net appropriations um, or spending actually in the since since 2018. Could that outcome be used to make the case for establishing a permanent disaster assistance program in the 2023 farm bill? And do we think a program would have support from farmers? I think, you know, we tried to do that once, right? With the supplemental SURE program. The SURE program. Um, another another acronym to add to the to the alphabet soup that that came and went. Um, our own Joe Jansen, I, I think, has has written some very important insights uh, related to this question. You know, the challenge with disaster assistance is that it's in response to a disaster. And, um, you know, at least in, in my relatively short experience, no two disasters are the same. And so it's, I think, one of the big challenges with a permanent disaster assistance program is designing something that would work and be kind of one size fits all for all disasters. And I think that's a really tough ask. Um, you know, one of the comments, I think, on Farm Bill programs the last five years is maybe they weren't designed the best to address some of the challenges that were faced with uh, trade retaliation and the pandemic. Um, and, you know, if you talk about taking a disaster assistance program to be a permanent standing program, you're going to you're going to face the same challenges with design and things are going to come up in the future where it doesn't fit right. And you're still probably in an ad hoc situation in those cases. So I don't know if Jonathan has anything more to add to that. But. <laughs> no, I, I, so I absolutely agree with you. And I will second plugging uh, Jansen's good work on this. I'll put a finer point on a couple things. Number one, to create a permanent disaster program, the sure experience is really critical because the problem is we have any, a very large and very effective crop insurance program that is designed for disasters uh, in the crop year. So you got to make sure any disaster program doesn't overlap or conflict with or double pay or overcompensate based on that. The second problem is we have uh, these Title I support programs. You also cannot overlap, conflict, or otherwise double pay under those. And fitting between Title I and crop insurance with a multi-year program is extraordinarily complicated and difficult to design. I'm sure the idea sounds great, and I'm sure farmers are very supportive of it. But the SURE program, again, reminds us that when it gets into operation, it is uh, often very problematic. And so designing that's a challenge. 
The other thing I would point out is that the budget scoring rules mean anything you create. So if it's a billion dollar program, it costs $10 billion in the baseline or in the score. That means you're paying for an awful lot of out year spending for a lot of unknown. Uh, you know, not to be put too much more of an edge on this, but the that we've shown in the last few years of nothing else, the Commodity Credit Corporation flexibilities are the best disaster assistance ad hoc uh, authorities we have on the books. And, and so far, if we don't change those too much, um, you know, that's going to be available. So I have a hard time seeing a good way of getting a permanent disaster program in the farm bill. Uh, we've got a couple other questions. Question. Well, one question, one comment. The first one is rumors flying around again that the Farm Service Agency might be contemplating getting rid of county committees. Uh, uh, listener want to know if there's any traction to that. County committees are authorized in the statute, so FSA cannot eliminate them of its own um, its own inclination. Um, but certainly, the county committees are an important part of operating the programs. But also, we've seen uh, a long history of really problematic. Uh, behavior by some county committees or some individuals on those county committees, uh, a lot of it feeding some of the discrimination, we've, or a lot of the discrimination we've seen in some of the loan programs and other programs. So I, I think that conversation is going to continue. I don't think the agency can do anything too um, permanent or drastic on its own initiative, but it, it is likely to get some focus in Congress in this farm bill. Um, and frankly, I think uh, there's no, there's no, uh, problem rethinking these things or reconsidering them and trying to trying to improve uh, both operation and fairness and equity uh, in our in our federal policy. So um, well, that, that will be to be determined. Uh, then finally, we have a comment about the nutrition title is over 80% of the spending and that trying to cut or eliminate it may well spell the demise of the farm bill. Uh, that is certainly true. It is the largest item. It's more than 80%. Uh, as we saw in 14 and 18, there's no real path forward for a farm bill in which that program has been cut uh, in a way that's opposed or partisan. Here's the other thing I'll add to this. And this is, it always sort of bothers me if we leave as the only, the only answer to this, what sounds like a cynical deal, political deal to count votes in Congress. What I would like everybody to remember is that the nutrition programs, the SNAP program, help people buy food. These are low income individuals. These are families, people with kids, elderly, some of them with um, disabled members of the household who are using these funds to buy food. And so it is important in its own right. It is unfortunate that we have so many people who fall below the poverty line and need this assistance. But it is not, in my mind, good politics to attack this program, particularly from a farmer standpoint, when these are helping you some of your customers purchase food in the supply chain to which you are supplying. So I would like to think that we could move beyond this debate and this discussion uh, and not go through this again, but I'm concerned that we will find ourselves uh, in a third time around um, fighting over a SNAP program. And with that, I think we've exhausted the patience of the, the audience. Uh, we thank you so much for joining us today, for listening through it, for uh, your interest in the farm bill. And I will hand uh, things back over to Todd Gleason to close us out, take us home, and wish everybody uh, a great day, weekend, and uh, look forward to our next interactions. Todd? We come to the end of the hour. Thank you, Jonathan Coppice and Nick Paulson for your time today, and Jim Baltz, who's behind the scenes as our technical director uh, you have been listening of course to the illinois farm economic summits this is the fourth in a six-part series two more yet to come you're already signed up for them if you have uh, been watching this on youtube you can still do that if you'd like at farmdocdaily.illinois.edu on behalf of the farm doc team i'm u of i extensions todd gleason wishing you a good day